the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I have a close friend who says he has nothing against ghosts as long as they mind their own business. The question then arises, what is their business? No one has ever really supplied a satisfactory answer to this, but almost all spiritualists and believers in the spirit world agree that most of the earthbound spirits have some sort of feeling of unfinished business or a wrong to be righted, a case to be pled. Now we go back to the year 1800 to tell a tale of today... That's supposed to be true. Young man, listen to me. I wish to talk with you. I mean you no harm. I ask only for you to listen. Oh, I've got to get a hold of myself. This is crazy. I'm not really hearing her voice. Yes, you are. You are hearing my voice. Juliana Sands, the girl you're painting. Only if you look closely, you will see that my eyes are rarely hazel, not green. That does it. I had better get out of this studio before I find myself carrying on conversations with my canvases. Come back. Come back. Come back. Our mystery drama, The Ghost in the Well, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Tony Roberts and Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The description of the artist as an individual with more than usual sensitivity has been drawn for us often. It should therefore come as no shock for a painter to realize that his artistic vision has penetrated into a world only dimly perceived by the rest of us. Nevertheless, when this happened to painter James Taxon, it was to prove a serious obstacle to what promised to be a flourishing career. I can't believe it, Jim. I just can't believe what I'm seeing. <laughs> Come off it, Lee. It's no big deal. No big deal? Here I am representing one of New York City's most talented and promising young artists, and I find five, not one, but five canvases. All of some frail, loony-looking dame wearing a dress which looks like she's been attending some masquerade party and all done in a diaphanous... No, it's translucent, I think. Oh, what's the difference? Why? That's what I'm asking you, Jim. Why? When we started our association, Lee, you agreed you wouldn't try to influence my work. I'd, I'd paint what I see and... Well, that agreement still holds, but it, it doesn't mean I have to keep my mouth shut when I think you're going off the rails. Oh, you're overreacting. And you're obsessed. What's so important about this woman? So all-consuming that it's... It, in the past three months, you've done nothing but paint the same picture over and over again. I want to get it right. The quality. The feeling. What I see. I'm, I'm, I'm just repeating myself. <laughs> Not only in words, but in your work. When are you going to go back to being the painter I know you are? When I get this portrait right. <laughs> I hated to admit it, but Lee was right. I'd allowed myself to become, uh, I suppose there's no other word, obsessed with this portrait. I'd better explain how it happened. Like so many other young artists, I live and work in a part of New York called Soho. Well, one night I couldn't sleep. I was sitting at one of the windows of my loft overlooking a small three-story building when I had what only can be described as a vision. A figure of a young woman dressed in 19th century clothes, seemed to rise from out of the ground in the air, up and up, until her eyes were level with mine. She gazed at me, imploringly. I felt compelled to paint her, to capture that look. For the next few months, I worked furiously, always on the same painting, and always I failed to capture that look in the eyes that it burned itself into my brain. Why do you frown so? The gentlemen I knew were always laughing. 
Because I can't get your eyes right. That's because you don't know anything about me. You don't listen. I'm a very fascinating person. Well, so I suppose you must be. Otherwise, I wouldn't be so interested in doing your portrait. I was murdered, you know. Don't try to... Murdered? Thrown down a well by a villain named Levi Weeks more than 100 years ago. Uh, That's it, Jim. What you need is a breath of fresh air. You're working too hard. You're hearing voices. Of course you hear me. I'm Juliana Sands. But if you look closely, you'll see my eyes are really hazel. Not green, the way you're trying to make them. That does it. Come back. Please, come back. I had to get out and walk. Just to think out what was happening to me. Either I was off to the edge and hearing voices... Or this vision I'd seen outside my window was really a ghost. Or a spirit. Or whatever. She... She'd given me a name. Juliana Sands. I headed for the library, and a researcher I knew there gave her the name, and she told me to come back in an hour. I did. And got a real shock. I apologize. I am not crazy. I'm not hearing voices. Well, aren't you going to say anything? Won't you accept my apology? Aren't you even curious about how I found out? Look, you, uh, Juliana Sands, I'm talking to you. Now, you answer me. I know all about Juliana. You fell into a well in December of 1799. You weren't murdered. You believe those lies they told in court. You're just like all men, ready to believe the worst. You're a strange ghost. I am not a ghost. I am a lingerer. (laughs) You're argumentative. I'll say that for you. I've been wronged and no one will listen. Well, what's the difference between a lingerer and a ghost? Ghosts are namby-pamby. Lingerers choose to stay on. Oh, you choose to stay? I just told you, silly. Why? To clear my name. You said you found out all about me, but you really don't know anything. Well, it's a matter of court record. Your boyfriend was Levi Weeks. He was accused of pushing you into the well. He was tried and acquitted. Because the stupid judge believed the lies that were told about me. Well, he had a pair of pretty good lawyers. Oh, Mr. Alexander Hamilton and Mr. Aaron Burr. It was the only time in history they were known to be on the same side. Well, you did take the trouble to look me up. Yes, I did. And you find me fascinating. Mm. Most men do. <laughs> You're also conceited. I looked you up because I wanted to find out if I was losing my mind, not because I find you fascinating. Then why are you painting me? Because I'm a painter. Also a fibber. You know you're entranced with the idea that you're actually talking to an alluring woman who lived a century ago. What do you want of me, Julia? There. You see? You've used my name. And it's just delightful to be asked what I want of someone. Usually I ask gentlemen what they want of me... Although, of course, I know perfectly well. I get the feeling you were a terrible flirt. Flirt, perhaps. But I'm afraid you'll turn out to be just like all the other men, all the men I knew who thought the worst of me. And, Jim, I hope to get better treatment from you. (laughs) What difference does it make to you now? I want you to paint me for the world to see me as I really was and am. A woman slandered and wronged. I want my name cleared. Cleared? Of what? From what I've been able to find out, you fell into a well. I was murdered. Cruelly and foully. Well, now the judge found... Levi! Levi Weeks! Come here this instant. Oh, no, Juliana, not again. I said, come here. Oh, what are you going to do? Are you going to bring someone else in on this? It's you I'm interested in. You're going to hear the truth. Right from the lips of this murderer. You have no right to name me murderer. The court... You you know very well what happened in the court, Levi. I insist that this gentleman hear it. I insist. Do you understand? I will clear the courtroom if we have any more disturbances. Pray continue, Colonel Burr. Thank you, Your Honor. As my learned colleague, General Hamilton, has already pointed out... The state is building its case against the accused on the question of motive. We will deal with that cloudy issue presently, 
But at the moment, I should like to continue with my examination of the accused. Now, Levi Weeks, remember, you're under oath. When did you last see Juliana Sand? On December 22nd. Afternoon or evening? The evening. I worked during the day. Exactly. And I'd like to point out to the members of the jury that your employer testified as to your character. If the uh, <clears throat> prosecutor doesn't object, I must, Colonel Burr. You will kindly confine yourself to questions. Uh, yes, Your Honor. How did you spend the evening of the 22nd, Mr. Weeks? I called for Juliana at her residence on Greenwich Street about 7 o'clock. And we proceeded to the Francis Tavern. As was customary, was it not, Mr. Weeks? We ate there quite frequently, yes. And uh, drank also, Mr. Weeks? We had wine, yes. Only wine? Or did not Mistress Sands have something stronger? I must say, Colonel, I fail to follow the reason for this line of questioning. Well, Your Honor, the doctors have been unable to ascertain exactly the cause of death. Part of our defense will be that the lady in question was in the habit of imbibing freely of spirit, and it could well be that in a state of drunkenness she fell into the well and was drowned. And now, Mr. Weeks, after you wined and dined, how did you spend the remainder of the evening? Well, you know we were, after a fashion, betrothed. Would you kindly clarify that for the jury? How does one become betrothed after a fashion? We uh, had an understanding. Had you spoken to the lady's father? Well, there was some talk about it. I see. And now, sir, after having heard the testimony of several young men in this courtroom that they had also escorted Mistress Sands at various times and to various places, I put it to you, did you know about her dalliance with these other men? Not all of them. And you made no objection? We had words once or twice. Words? Quarrels? Or violent altercations? Just lost words. Exactly. And now, Mr. Weeks, I ask you, if you had known about all these other men in the life of Miss Juliana Sands, would you have made violent objections? I am not a violent man. Ah, I think it most fitting for the jury and the judge to know exactly how you felt about your betrothed's amorous behavior with other men. Well, I knew that Juliana was headstrong and she was flirtatious. Liked a good time, like parties and dancing. But your question is difficult for me. Well, let me then put it another way, Mr. Weeks. The prosecution contends that you killed Juliana Sands in a fit of jealousy. Yet your sworn testimony indicates you are not of a jealous disposition. You knew of some of her liaison with other men, yet you only had words. And even if you knew of the others, you would hardly have taken the violent course of homicide. Is that not a just statement of your feelings? I didn't kill her, if that's what you mean. That is exactly what I mean. And although we cannot say for certain that she was murdered at all, we can say with a great deal of assurance that Juliana Sands was a loose, wanton woman who might very well have jeopardized her life. You have no right to make such flower accusations about my daughter. Every word you've uttered is a lie. And I, who knew and loved my Juliana since she was a little girl, will see to it that these jurymen are not deceived by your abomination. <laughs> impossible scene? A wild creation in imagination of some fiction writer? Not at all. In the spring of the year 1800, in New York City, a man named Levi Weeks was tried for the murder of a young woman named Juliana Sands, and his defense attorneys were Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. And the testimony went very much as you heard it. We'll continue with Act Two shortly. Courtroom drama is always composed of the stuff of life. 
But when you find yourself a spectator at a trial that took place in 1800, and you are there by courtesy of the ghost of the alleged victim, that drama takes on overtones of spiritualism and undertones of science fiction and the time machine. That's precisely the situation in which our talented painter James Taxon finds himself. I attributed my comparative calm to the fact that I had been reassured I wasn't losing my mind. My library researcher friend had dug further and come up with more information on the trial of Levi Weeks. There was absolutely no doubt that such a trial with such characters had actually taken place. I didn't think I was hallucinating. Now the question remained how best to rid myself of my obsession with the portrait of Juliana Sands. I decided that getting the whole story might be the answer. Therefore, I looked hard at my last unfinished canvas. Nothing happened. I closed my eyes. <laughs> you look silly with your eyes closed. Oh, I'm glad you're back. I want to talk to you. Naturally. I've always been very popular with members of the opposite sex. I, um, uh, I want to know more about what happened at the trial. Just a lot more nastiness. Well, those are words, and I want the truth. And that's what you shall have, but we need Levi for that. Oh, no, Juliana, not again. Now, Levi, you know very well that we haven't come anywhere near telling the whole story. Must we? I insist. And you may as well begin by saying that you were too much a gentleman or too frightened to tell the court. After we supped that night at France's tavern, what did we do? You always could shock me, Juliana. I fail to see what's shocking about the idea of a betrothed couple anticipating their wedding night. The sins that you do by two and two, you must pay for one by one. Hmm, do you hear that, Levi? Uh, I was just quoting from a great English poet named Rudyard Kipling. Levi, you might tell the gentleman how an ordinary carpenter came to be represented by two such distinguished attorneys as Mr. Mr. Alexander Hamilton and Mr. Aaron Burr. Purely a matter of politics. Hmm, does that explanation satisfy you, sir? No way. I'd like it a little more in detail. Well, I first met Colonel Burr when I did some carpentry work for him. The Colonel was much interested in the details and we fell to talking. At which Levi is very good. I cannot tell this gentleman what he wants to know if you're going to interrupt continually. Do forgive me, Levi. I've always been interested in politics, and you may not be aware of it, but Colonel Burr was consumed by the ambition to be president. When I'd stop for lunch, the colonel would sit with me and we'd talk. The colonel was much impressed because I spent three or four evenings a week at the Tammany Society, which did me the honor to elect me leader. We were also in touch with other like-minded clubs throughout the state, and so a relationship developed. Mm, relationship indeed. You promised that conniving little colonel to deliver the Tammany Society votes, which would enable him to gain control of the New York State Legislature. Oh, women don't understand politics. Now, neither do I. What did gaining control of the state legislature accomplish for Aaron Burr? Well, the legislature named the presidential electors to the Electoral College, and New York was a pivotal state. I believe that has since been changed. Oh, yes, it has. And, and now you're explaining how it happened that Aaron Burr was willing to undertake your defense, but... What about Alexander Hamilton? Have you never heard, sir, that politics makes strange bedfellows? Now, now, wait a minute. Now, I, I know a little about American history, and Hamilton was a Federalist, while Burr was a Jeffersonian Democrat, so... Politics also make hypocrites. Tell him, Levi. Oh, please shut up, Juliana. Although it was quite true that there was antagonism between Colonel Burr and General Hamilton, nevertheless, they both found it politic to present the outward appearance of friendliness... And this was just such an opportunity. Yes, but I don't understand why your case presented such a great opportunity. Because of me, sir. Because of my beauty. And because of the loathsome, lewd curiosity of men who delighted in hearing my name bandied about in the court. The judge permitted the wildest and most lascivious speculations about my private life. I assure you, it was a sensation. Oh, as usual, Juliana exaggerates. She took courtroom rhetoric for statements of fact when it was only designed to prove to my... prove me a woman of low character and loose morals. And as for more courtroom rhetoric, why don't we go back and let this artist hear for himself what your fine Colonel Burr had to say. 
gentlemen of the jury, we come to the character of this woman. I remind you once again of the evening of the 3rd of December when she and her intended Levi Weeks were at the Tammany Society Ball. You have the sworn testimony that she entertained not one, not two, but three young men on the upper floors of the society's building. And all this, mind you, while her fiancé, this hard-working young man, was downstairs searching everywhere for the lady who had plighted her troth to him. Levi, you heard those disgusting insinuations he made to the jury. How I raged when I heard those words. And how bored I get when I hear you bring them up year after year, century after century, will it never end. Only when I'm satisfied that my name has been cleared. You knew I was upstairs. You knew exactly where I was and with whom and what I was doing. Colonel Byrne never said... Colonel Byrne never said the truth. I thought it would be a lark to go upstairs and peep into the gaming rooms where you gentlemen spend so much of your time. I told you that this was explained to both Colonel Burr and General Hamilton, and they both felt it would injure my defense. By branding me harlot, or worse. Juliana, you were dead. And the dead can be slandered. But not with impunity. Oh, you found that out, didn't you, Levi? Oh, hold on, you two. Hold on. Now, Juliana... Yes, Jim? You told me you wanted me to paint you as you really are. And if you and Levi just continue to squabble, I'm beginning to see you as a shrew. You promised me the truth. And I'm trying to get it for you. But this wretched excuse for a man persists in hiding the truth from you. And even after all these years, deludes himself. About what? Name one thing that has been said here that is not true. Oh, do you recall these words? Levi, the prosecution contends that you killed Juliana Sands in a fit of jealousy. Yet your sworn testimony indicates that you are not of a jealous disposition. You knew of some of her liaison with other men, yet you only had words. Is that not a just statement of your feelings? But... Remember my answer to Colonel Burr. I didn't say I wasn't jealous. I said I didn't kill you. You left the impression that you were a gentle man. When really, Jim, the reverse is true. And I will prove it. Do you remember the night of the Federalist Ball? Who uh, was that young popinjay you were dancing with? His name is William Gates. Any relation to the general? His nephew. How did you meet him? Were you properly introduced? Of course. He saw me standing at the punch table, introduced himself in a most genteel fashion, and asked me to dance. And it never entered your head to refuse? Why should I? Were you off talking politics with some of your playfellows? You know I don't like you dancing with other men. Oh, does that include Colonel Burr? Well, of course not. The colonel is different. Pray, tell me how. Well, he's older. He knows me, and he... Well, you know what I mean. Of course, dear heart. If you feel it's to your advantage for me to dance with a man when it's permissible. But if I should find it entertaining to dance with someone, it is forbidden. I tell you flatly, I don't want you dancing with other men. And I tell you that until I am your wife, I shall dance with whom I please, unless you're at my side. You'll do nothing of the kind. You'll behave like a proper lady or you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Well, Levi, aren't you going to tell this delightful young artist the rest of the story? Or have you forgotten what happened later? I lost my temper again. It was more than that. Well, I had warned you not to dance with anyone else. And when I saw you on the floor with that insufferable gait... You rushed out, snatched me from his arms, and would have struck him and challenged him to a duel if you hadn't been forcibly restrained. While you're at it, don't neglect to tell him that you enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, it was exciting. And romantic. There, you see, sir? You hear? Well, I hear everything except the one thing I want to hear, and that is... Did you kill her or didn't you? You did. I did not. Oh, come on now. What difference does it make at this time? How can it matter to either of you? Levi, I think I've made a mistake. Not for the first time, Juliana. Oh, but he seems so sensitive. 
And he was trying to paint the real me. I could feel it. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. I thought I'd finally found someone who understood. Well, I've been trying, but you're not only unsubstantial, you've got a wildly mercurial personality. Thank you. I shall always remember that. If you decide to continue with my portrait, I do hope you get my eyes right. You're leaving? I'm afraid so. Yeah, and what about your crusade to clear your name? And have the world see you as you really are. Or were. It will have to wait. But I have plenty of time. Yes, but what about me? I mean, I must finish your portrait. That will pass when we're no longer in contact. Oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't, don't go. You'd better talk into that talk thing. Oh, just hold on until I answer this call. I hate waiting. Oh, it won't take a minute. Hello. Jim, this is Lee. Remember me? Uh, yes, Lee. Look, I'm busy right now. Can I call you back? No way. I've been trying to reach you for days. Where have you been? Well, I've been right here. I've been working. You took the phone off the hook, didn't you? Lee, I'm sorry, but I really can't talk to you now. <laughs> Either talk to me... Or talk to a doctor. What? You haven't. I haven't, but Janice has. Remember Janice? Oh, yes, of course, I remember Janice. Janice? Should I be jealous? Hey, quiet, will you? What? Is there someone there with you? No, 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 no one. But what has Janice done? She's spoken to her brother, the one who's a big shot psychiatrist, and... Oh, she had no right to do that. She loves you, Jim. She's worried, and I agree she's got a right to be worried. Goodbye. I told you I dislike waiting. Uh, hold on a second, Lee. Please, please be patient. Just a minute. You owe me a favor. I owe you nothing. But I'll stay for a little. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, look, Lee, what's gotten into you and Janice? I ask what's gotten into you. You shut yourself up. You turn off the phone. You hung up on doing the portrait of some strange dame, which isn't your style at all, and Janice and I are worried. We think you need help. I really refuse to wait and listen to any more of this silly talk. Please, it's my agent and best friend. Look, he's worried about me. As am I. I'm, I'm sorry, Lee. I, I just thought I heard someone at the door. Oh, it's obvious, Jim. There's somebody there with you. Do you want to tell me who it is, or did Janice and her brother and I come up there? No. Uh, look, just give me... How long, Juliana, for the truth? How long? The trial lasted a week. The... Excuse me, please. How fast can you work? When I know the truth, I'll have you on canvas in a day. Tell him the day after tomorrow. Uh, hello? Hello, Jim? Uh, hello, uh, Lee. Lee. Just leave me alone till the day after tomorrow, and you and Janice and the whole world can come and see me then. The whole world? <gasps> At last, the whole world will see Juliana as she truly is. <laughs> Our charming ghost is putting too much trust in a painting. After all, a painting, no matter how great a work of art, can present many faces to different people. But more importantly, can Jim Taxon find out where the truth lies in this tangled skein that hasn't been unraveled in more than a century? We'll be back with Act Three shortly. I think I can qualify as somewhat of an authority on ghosts and ghost lore. And I've never heard of a ghost being reported in a spanking new high-rise office building or a condominium. No, the habitat of ghosts is almost always in the ancient relics or ruins that have stood for centuries. Today, in New York City's Soho district, there is an ancient well with a history. And, some say, with a ghost. Which brings us to the horns of the dilemma on which Jim Taxon is impaled. I'd made a commitment and I intended to keep it. I dismissed the notion that there was anything wrong with my mind because I had accepted the fact that somehow I'd made contact with a ghost, a specter, or whatever you care to call it, of a woman who'd died in 1799. I realized, however, that painting her had become almost an obsession with me, and I was forced to face the possibility that she might be playing some devilish game that was robbing me of my creativity as an artist. I determined to find this out, so I picked up my brushes and 
turned to the latest canvas I'd started. Oh, you poor dear mortal. You mustn't let me frighten you. All I want is to make myself whole. Yes, that's what you've been telling me, but there seems to be some questions about your truthfulness. You must admit that at times you're... you're mischievous. I am what I am. But I'm also a woman wronged. And today, I promise you the absolute proof. Hmm. Does that mean another argument between you and Levi? We will need Levi. But there'll be no argument about this. Will there, Levi? Levi? I'm here, Juliana. I want you to tell this gentleman quite calmly and without any evasion that you were the father of my unborn child. I will tell him the facts. If it is true that you were pregnant at the time of your death, it's probable mm, that I... You're still trying to wriggle out of accepting responsibility. Tell him. Tell him you fathered my child. All right, cool it now. Cool it, Juliana. All I'm getting is more complications and further arguments. You have every right to be annoyed. <laughs> but it would be taken care of if this colonial clod would admit that he not only murdered me, but also my child when he threw me down that well. It's indescribably frightening to witness an argument between apparitions. But that's exactly what Juliana's accusation touched off. The only way I could bring some semblance of order out of this eerie chaos was to threaten to leave. Neither of them seemed to want that. I bring this matter of the child up now because... It was a most important point at the trial. The prosecution claimed I was pregnant, which immediately labeled me wanton. But I don't understand. If you were pregnant with Levi's child and you were going to be married... I can't, you understand. You're sensitive enough to have made contact, but you cannot see how scandalous it was to be in my situation without being a respectable wife. I was an outcast. That was the main reason that my reputation had to be blackened still further. No, you've lost me again. The prosecution said that Levi had killed me because he had discovered he wasn't the father of my child and he didn't want to marry me. That certainly was not true. I desperately wanted to marry you. Mm, you did. But you killed me for quite another reason. But the defense attorneys easily persuaded Levi to allow them to make me out to be a wanton. Did I ever actually deny the possibility I was the father? Not you, Levi. You played the noble, put-upon gentleman. Were you the father? I'm pretty sure I was. Pretty sure? He was. Well, now, Juliana, what about that all-day excursion you took to Harlem with General Gates' nephew? Most of it was spent in the coach with four other people present. All right, now, let's stop it right here. No more arguments between you two. I must hear about the night of the murder. There was no murder. I want to know what happened that night. Tell him, Levi. Tell him about your first lie, your sworn testimony in the courtroom. Oh, you've told me so much and argued so much. I don't remember what he said. He said the last time he saw me was December 22nd. Isn't that what you told the court, Levi? Yes. And that was a lie, wasn't it? Yes. You really saw me Christmas Eve, didn't you? I did. And that was the night you killed me, wasn't it? I did not kill you. Oh, well, why don't you stop the accusations and the denials, get to what happened, and let me decide? Levi's already admitted that he lied about the last time he saw me. What happened that night? Oh, it was a beautiful night. Clear, with just a sliver of a moon, and all the stars winking like candles on a Christmas tree. We strolled along Green Street, holding hands. Remember, Levi? Not likely I'll be allowed to forget, Juliana. We were on our way to my house, and I said, Levi, we must set a date for our wedding. You never cease to amaze me, my love. Your father won't even permit us to announce our engagement, and here you are talking about setting a date for our marriage. You would not like your child to be born without a name, would you, Levi? What are you saying? I'm a child, Levi. Are you sure? Certain. Oh, it's another one of your jests. A poor one, I must say. I mean it. It's true. How, how can it? We, we haven't... I am two months pregnant, dear heart. Two months? Yes. But what does that matter? What matters is that tomorrow, on Christmas Day, when you join us for our celebration, you tell my father that there will be no more shilly-shallying, that we love each other deeply... And we wish to be married as soon as possible. You think he won't question this sudden, unseemly haste? We are young and ardent. 
We've waited long enough. There's no more to be said. Your father may have something to add. I do believe you're afraid of him, Levi. Nonsense. Come. Let's continue on our way. Ah, oh, it's a lovely night. But I begin to feel chill when we're not moving. Two months. Were you not on that outing with young Gates about two months ago? I thought we already had our quarrel about that. Well, I think this news you've given me makes a difference. I've always been honest with you, Levi, as with everyone. Have you? When have I not? I cannot tell. And that's what eats at me. You're thinking about my Harlem excursion with that silly young Gates, aren't you? Yes. And I used to be so proud of your jealousy. Proud? <laughs> Perhaps not proud, but secretly I enjoyed it. It tickled my fancy that I should get you so annoyed and angry over trifles. I was wrong. Yes. And so were you, to take my little flirtation seriously. And now you tell me you're with child. Levi, suppose, just suppose, well, I mean, you see this well? Yes. Just suppose it were a wishing well. Do you know what I would wish? What? That you knew me well enough to know that I truly love only you. You have no cause for jealousy. That would be my wish. Said, I would wish that you were more like the other ladies in deportment. You wouldn't love me if I were all languishment and easy to tears. Levi, only you alone can be the father of the child I carry. But did you hear me? I heard you. I wish I could believe you. All right. You wish to believe the word? Then you may as well hear it. You want to believe it, so I'll tell you what you want to hear. Not the truth, but what you're determined to have, for heaven only knows what reason. Oh, Juliana, stop. Oh, I... no, it's too late, Levi. Yes, yes, we did. We went to Harlem, the Gates boy, and I, we walked along the riverbank away from the other people and found... Oh, no, you, you... Levi, Levi, you're hurting. Let go of me. you to play with me. I'll scrap you, do you beg for mercy? Oh, Levi, the world... Pressing against my back. I don't know what's true or false for you. Levi, devil, devil, I'm falling here. Juliana, Juliana, I didn't mean for you to fall. Well, Mr. Portrait Painter, now you know the truth you've been seeking. Tell me, is he not a murderer? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Not know? How can you not know? You see, Juliana? It's all for naught. He's heard everything and he's... Still... No, not everything. He hasn't heard the verdict, nor what my father said in the court. He must hear that. Oh, it's useless. It's a waste of time. And what else do we have but time, Levi Weeks? What else? <clears throat> Gentlemen of the jury, you have reached the verdict of not guilty. A verdict in which I heartily concur. The jury is dismissed with the thanks of the court and the defendant, Levi Weeks, is freed. Now you will hear me, and I shall not remain silent. The defendant may go free, but you, Alexander Hamilton, and you, Aaron Burr, will be forever cursed for besmirching the name of my lovely daughter, for destroying the name and character of a sinless young woman, you are damned. I call upon the higher court, the just God in heaven, to see that you are punished for this affront to all virtue. Uh, remove, remove this man from the court. Take him, I say. And you, a judge who judges not, you, sir, will also feel the weight of my curse. Now and forever. Painter, you have the truth. All of it. How will you paint me? Truly. Truly. As I saw you and see you clearly. A lovely, laughing, hazel-eyed girl. With a glimpse of mischief dancing in them. And it will be seen by the world? Yes, I hope so. I think it will because I feel it will be the best work I've ever done. Bravo. At last the world will see me as a woman wronged. Not as I was portrayed in the court. I will be free. And I, Juliana? Will I be left to bear the guilt? Unjustly also, as you know, Painter. I never meant to harm her. I don't know, Levi. I'm an artist. 
I don't stand in judgment. Well, tell me. Tell us. What do you truly think is right? The same as before, Levi. The sins that you do two by two, you pay for one by one. Most people today don't believe in the power of curses. But let's look at what we know. We know there was such a trial. We also know there was such a curse pronounced. We also know that Aaron Burr killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel on the heights of Weehawken, New Jersey. We know, too, that Burr was later accused of treason and forced to flee the country. I'll be back shortly to tell you what happened to the judge. to the judge who presided over the trial of Levi Weeks, accused of the murder of Juliana Sand. The trial took place in 1800. Twenty-nine years later, on a December evening in 1829, the judge walked out of his hotel on Lower Broadway and was never seen again. Something to think about until we meet again. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Patricia Elliott, Court Benson, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.